Hey everyone, today we're going to be doing a look back on an older graphics card. Uh, it's the GTS 250 1GB version. This card was released back in March of 2009 for the total cost of $149. There was also a 512MB variant that went for $130. Alright, let's dive into the specs. This is a 55 nanometer GPU. It has a 128 processor cores, 16 ROPs, 64 texture filtering units, and it also has a TDP of 150 watts. Uh, this specific variant has one 6-pin connector, and its clock speed for the GPU runs at 738 megahertz. The shader units uh, run at 1836 megahertz, and the memory clock is uh, 1100 megahertz, which is effective uh, 2200 megahertz. The total memory configuration for this model is 1024 megabytes. As I stated, the uh, they do have a 512 megabyte model as well. Uh, the memory interface is 256 bit, and the total memory bandwidth is 70.4 gigabytes per second. So the GTS 250 is essentially the last of the G92 GPUs. The G92 was first introduced with the 8800 GTS 512 megabyte version. Then it was re-released as the 9800 GTX, which had higher clock speeds. And then it was released again as a 9800 GTX Plus, which featured the G92B GPU, which also had higher clock speeds and was based on the 55 nanometer process. It was also thought to consume less power as well. Um, then again, it was released as a GTS 250, so it's, it was really in four iterations. They weren't exactly the same, but um, pretty much. But it was a great GPU, but NVIDIA kind of have rebranded and rebadged it so many times, it was pretty much time to retire it. But overall, it was still a pretty good performer. So one of the biggest issues with this card is realistically the API support. This card only features DirectX support up to 10. So 10.1, 11, 12, you're out of luck. Any games that require those API support, it's not going to work. It will do OpenGL up to 3.0, which is nice, but no Vulkan support, obviously. Regardless, there are still a lot of games that use DX9 and DX10. Anyways, I tested a handful of games um, at 720p and 1080p and was surprised how well it handled them. Um, I will say the majority of them ran at 1080p. So popular games like CSGO ran great at 1080p, I think medium settings for the most part. Over 60 frames per second, that's more than enough for um, someone getting into CSGO and wanted to try it out. Obviously competitive players are probably playing up a lot of higher frame rates and etc. so they'll want more powerful cards, but um, Dota 2, 1080p, uh, medium settings, over 60 frames per second. Another great game where you can pour a ton of time into. This game, this card plays it great at 1080p. Uh, Paladins, it's a uh, Overwatch knockoff, but it runs fine with DX10, and it runs great, maxed out, 1080p, over 60 frames per second. Uh, another Diablo clone, uh, Path of Exile, runs great, maxed out at 1080p, over 60 frames. Um, and I know those are not hard to run games, but they're all free-to-play games and are a blast to play. Um, then you also have Skyrim. Skyrim runs great, medium settings, 1080p, over 30 frames per second. Uh, then you have other games like Bioshock Infinite. It can run low settings, 1080p, around 35 to 40 frames per second. Just Cause 2 runs great at 1080p, uh, over over 30 frames per second at 1080p. And then you have other games like GTA 5 um, and Metro, Last Light and, and Metro. Those games are, are going to be harder to run. you got to run those at probably 720p from what I've seen. Low settings to even get to that 30 frames per second mark, um, at least consistently. You can, you'll can you see spikes higher than that, but for consistency. Now another great way to increase performance on older GPUs like this one is obviously to overclock them. And this card comes with a core clock frequency out of the gate at 738 megahertz. So at this point in time, there was no such thing as boost clock, GPU boost, anything like that. So it was a constant static 738 megahertz. Now in this PNY sample that I have, I was able to get it up to 792 megahertz on the core. And I know it's not a lot, but it does count for something. Also the shader clock speed, I was able to get from 1836 
1998, so close to 2000, which is pretty respectable. Um, on modern day utilities like Afterburner, uh, unfortunately, you can't unlink the core clock and the shader clock. So you'd have to use an older program like Riva Tuner or something like that to do that. I, I didn't really bother with it. I kind of linked them. They were both linked. Kind of went as high as I could go and, uh, and took it from there. But with newer architectures such as Kepler, Maxwell, Pascal on NVIDIA side, you don't have to worry about shader clock speeds. Um, the shaders run at the same core f frequency as the core clock and nowadays. Uh, back um, in the old days when the unified architecture was introduced with the 8800 uh, GTX, uh, the shader clocks had their own clock speeds, but typically ran double the frequency as the core clock. So you had the ability to uh, increase um, and decrease the clock speeds on both the core and the shader clock speed as well. So don't have to worry about that too much anymore. Regardless, I was, at, uh, was also able to increase the memory clock rate from the GDDR3 from 1100 megahertz to 1296. So it's actually a pretty good overclock on the memory. So with these overclocks, I was pretty much seeing in a lot of the games that I tested an increase anywhere from 4 frames per second to upwards of 10 frames per second. So it's not a huge increase, but if your game is running at 50 frames per second, and maybe you can get it closer to 60, or if you're at 20, you can get closer to 30, it's definitely worth doing. Uh, you can't add voltage to these cards, so it's not you're not really at risk of really damaging them unless you overheat them, uh, which in this case, the... PNY card is um, has a pretty substantial cooler on it, and it even overclocked at a modest fan speed, it doesn't really get close to 70C. And these uh, G92s are, are rated up to 105C. They don't have all the, the nice new uh, throttling features as the newer cards, so if you do get them over that, you are at risk of actually damaging it. So keep that in mind. All right, well, that about wraps up the look back slash review of the GTS 250. This isn't really a review to go and convince you to go buy one. I mean, there, there's that's an old card. It's kind of a cool little, you know, retrospective look at this card. I remember back when this card was released, it was an okay card. And I remember buying this card a long time ago. I remember having 8800 GTs on all the G92 and G80 cards as well. And it's kind of cool to see where they land today as far as, you know, what games they can play in, etc. So, um, a lot of these free-to-play games, like Paladins, uh, Path of Exile, even Team Fortress, Dota 2, League of Legends, games like that, I mean, this card can still play them fine at current resolutions, like 1080p. So if you got a buddy that has one laying in a closet in a scrap heap somewhere and it still works, hey, you know what? Set up your, your child or set up uh, someone you may know that's just getting into PC gaming with it just to get them to try it out. If you find one on Craigslist for 10 20 bucks hopefully closer to 10 bucks. you know, it's not a bad buy. It's still faster than what you're going to find in a lot of the iGPUs. But it's still a fun look back on the card, to me at least. Um, but anyways, I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for checking out the video. Bye.